Okay, well, um, wow, thank you so much, everyone. Um, it's really great to uh, to be able to talk to you here. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, I have still got a bit of COVID cough, um, so apologies if you get a bit of that in this talk. Um, my name is Mike Cook. I'm a senior lecturer at King's College London, and today I'm here to talk to you about a new generated, um, which generated uh, platforming games uh, based on news articles. Um, they were very weird, uh, and in the decades since then, I've been working on more systems like that um, that generate games or that model games um, in this field that that we kind of informally call automated game design. And in the paper, I describe it as you know systems which model, participate in, or support the game design process. So it's not just systems that generate games. Um, lots of other work goes on in there as well. And over the last uh, you know, five years in particular, um, I got some funding uh, which allowed me to do a lot of independent research and really think for a while about like why exactly um, I, I'm interested in generating games. Like, why do we do that? Um, and actually this year at COG, I published a paper about the motivations of game AI researchers, which I'd love to hear your opinions on if you get a chance to read it. Um, but a lot of my thinking around this kind of led me to produce Puck, which is um, you know, the system that I'm talking about today. Um, um, and sort of explore a bit kind of why I've been doing this research for over a decade now. So why do people generate games? Well, a very common reason is to help other people design games. So if we look at systems like uh, the automatic generation of uh, Game Boy RPGs using GB Studio, um, you know, lots of people are interested in building models of game design that can help other people make their own games, whether they're experts or, or novices. Um, and in terms of other reasons, I mean, one thing that comes up a lot is the idea of generating really good games. Um, and if we look at other creative AI areas like uh, Stable Diffusion or Midjourney um, in the visual arts area, there's definitely a sense that AI should be used to generate high quality creative outputs, right? This is definitely something which people often think of. And, and another thing which they think about is generating stuff quickly. So when I was making uh, Angelina, which was the, the precursor to Puck, uh, journalists would often ask me how quick it could make games, whether it could make games faster. And we're seeing now that systems like Stable Diffusion are really interested in real-time generation, right? But I realized that neither of those things actually mattered to me. Like when I was reflecting on building the system, I, I realized that I didn't actually care about these things. And I wondered what it would be like to build a system that also was not particularly interested in these things. And part of the reason for that is a couple of years ago, I, I gave a, a tutorial at COG where I talked about the infinite Rembrandt zone, which a lot of AI systems tend towards where the aim is to produce masterpiece quality work for zero cost or time or resources. And there's something kind of counterintuitive, I think, about that. There's a big question of whether we actually want this. Um, but that is where I see a lot of creative AI systems going now. Um, and this has been happening kind of in the last few years while I was working on Puck. So if we're not looking to build systems that produce infinite Rembrandts, then what are we trying to build? Well, this is Puck. Uh, this is the system I ended up building as an answer to that question. Um, and Puck is kind of like a Pokemon. This is the explanation I've been giving lately. Um, and this is what I call the Pokemon model of AI. Um, and I'm going to explain to you what I mean by that in the next few slides. So what features do Pokemon have? Well, they're kind of friendly and cute and personal, and people build individual connections to them. A lot of the technology that we call personalized today, like our Netflix recommendations, isn't really personal at all. It's actually the opposite. It's got these buckets that already exist, and it's trying to find which bucket you are nearest to so it can put you in it. So when I built Puck, I was thinking more of the kinds of software that I grew up in in the 90s and early noughties, software that you kind of felt a sense of ownership and control over and you understood. And I think of Puck kind of as closer to a desktop pet more than anything. The other thing about Pokemon is that although a lot of exciting things happen in the cartoons and video games, um, most people's experience in the world of Pokemon is just them helping with everyday life. And um, one of the reviewers for this paper very, very helpfully directed me to the slow technology movement, which is um, a decades old now kind of interest in uh, technology, which is not interested in efficiency, which is just about integrating into people's everyday lives. And that perfectly overlaps with my intentions with Puck. And the other thing about Pokemon is that they don't require much resources to run, right? They're kind of small and cute and you just give them a snack every now and again. And that's really important when we think not just about the environmental cost of machine learning, which people talk about and it's unclear what the real impact of it is, but even things just like technology is just, we can't just keep expecting technology to advance forever, right? It's nice to have systems which run on nothing and Puck does run on kind of whatever you put it on. Um, it doesn't benefit from extra computational resources because it's not trying to be fast. It's not trying to be quick. 
And finally, Pokemon are kind of well behaved, like they, they're well understood, you know, you know what a Pokemon does, um, it's right there in front of you, there's no hidden stuff happening behind the scenes. I don't know Pokemon that well, maybe there are a few where that's not the case. Um, but the thing with something like an Alexa is a lot of people don't really understand the technology that they have in their homes anymore. Um, and there was a time when people did understand it better, I feel like, and they had access to it, and they were able to control it and open it up. And, and now we talk to these systems that talk back to us from some server somewhere, and we don't really have any idea of what that is. And so I ended up building Pup kind of as a, a system to explore what I felt like I wanted out of creative AI systems. Um, now, I'm not going to give you loads of technical details on this talk. Um, in solidarity with you all at the conference, I've had very little sleep and too much coffee. Um, so there are more technical details in the paper, but I thought I'd give you a little tour of some of its features. So um, when you look at Puck, you know, this is the design mode of Puck, um, and it's got the, the display of the game that it's currently working on. So at the moment, it makes these very primary colors like mobile slash puzzle games, and you can watch it play games while it's testing them. Um, and it tries to give descriptions of games which are very bad and broken. Um, this is a broken one in the screenshot. Um, but it tries to give the player information. Um, it's, there's a lot more communication in it than any of my previous systems. And also, crucially, Puck is something that you can download. You can have your own version of Puck, right? Just like the individualized Pokemon. Um, and that means that this is something which you control. It's more like an app on your, on your uh, PC rather than Angelina, which was a research platform, really. So you can ask, you can press buttons and get more information. And you can press buttons and get Puck to stop designing. Um, and if you stop it designing, what you might do instead is go and look at all of the games that it's made. So you can go into its database and ask it to show you all of its games. And it'll tell you the rankings of the games based on its current understanding of their quality. And it will tell you things like how many times it's tested the game and where roughly it feels those games are. And there's features for users to kind of favorite games and leave notes for themselves and rename them because you can see that there are lots of features missing right now. Like we don't have a game naming system at the moment in place. Um, inside it, Puck has this uh, finite state machine that kind of runs uh, what we call moods. Um, and moods is a, a charged term, which some of the reviewers did point out was kind of anthropomorphizing, which is true, but it was always supposed to be an internal term for me, uh, and not for anyone else to see. But basically, a mood is just a, a state that it can be in where it does stuff. Um, and one of the things that I've tried to do is uh, allow this state machine to be quite flexible. So in the future, what I'm like is for each Puck to be a little bit different. So your version of Puck might be a little bit more willing to to generate new games. It might get bored more easily, um, or it might be unwilling. It might be drilled down on like one design and play it over and over again. Um, and I want that sense of um, the systems having some variety between them. So each instance of Puck is a little bit different. One technical point I did want to mention is the fact that Puck has a very long-term memory. So in a previous version of Angelina, uh, we had it uh, create what we call project files, which were a game that it was working on that it would have, you know, it would come back to and change over time. And this was me beginning to experiment with the idea of recording uh, creative projects and having them last for a long time. But with Puck, Puck records everything. Puck records every bad game that it plays. It records the exact data from playouts, like which agents played it, how they were configured, what moves they made. And we kind of take a page out of Nathan Sturtevant's work on exhaustive PCG. Um, it's not exhaustive because Puck doesn't play every game, but it's what I call partially exhaustive. So it eventually will exhaust the design space, but in reality, it will never get there. So why do I do this? Well, it has so many really interesting side effects. Um, so one of the side effects, for example, is that uh, the integrity of the data that it stores is like Puck's entire brain. So if you fix a bug in the way the MCTS agent runs, or if you change what one of the words means in, in its design language, all of the knowledge it has about the games that it's already played is now flawed, and you have to think whether there's a way to fix it or patch it. So your relationship with the data is very interesting as, as the developer. One other thing I really like is that the idea of a bad game is now relative. So during development, many times, Puck would have a game that it thought was very bad. It might be ranked like 1,200 out of a list of 1,400 games. But then I change the way that games are evaluated, or I change something about the way it understands gameplay, and suddenly this game that it thought was bad, it now reconsiders, and it shoots to the top of the list. It starts exploring it more, fleshing it out, and suddenly it's telling me that this game is worth checking out. 
And I love this because it's only possible because of this long-term memory. So hopefully Puck will start reconsidering games that it's had you know, in its database for years, maybe because you've told it something about what a good game is that's changed its metrics and it's ended up reconsidering something. And that's a great creative story to tell. So if you know my research in the past, you know I'm really interested in computational creativity and telling stories and getting people to engage with the process of these systems. Um, and having this long-term data is a great opportunity for that. So this is the kind of like my favorite thing about Puck, but there's a bit more about that in the paper. Um, in terms of future work for Puck, uh, I now have a permanent job for the first time, which is very exciting and I'm incredibly grateful given the state of the UK. Um, but it also means, boy, there's a lot more to do than there was two or three years ago. Um, so I don't get a chance to work on Puck very much at the moment, but um, my plans for the near future are to add uh, an interface that lets people design games inside Puck. So this is quite important because it will allow you to exchange knowledge the other way with Puck. So you'll be able to show it a game and say, I think this game is good, or maybe ask it, what would you do to improve this game? And that's where we begin to um, improve Puck's role as a member of a creative community, which is the real goal of building the system. Puck is also highly modular. So all of the visualizers, the agents, even the design language itself, they can all be switched out very easily. So the next stage uh, for that is to add new types of game in. Um, little adventure games is the next thing that we're going to uh, work on. Um, and finally, we want to work a lot on the game descriptions and communications. So Puck has a lot of features for streaming on Twitch, which we want to extend. Um, and I'm also going to be working with some of my colleagues at King's on natural language processing and argumentation and dialogue so that we can actually have Puck um, again be a, a creative community member that you can discuss and, and hear from. Um, this was uh, uh, supposed to, um, I, I broke the builds on this PDF just before uh, presenting this, but one thing I wanted to talk about before, before I wrap up is that um, working on this process over time has made me reflect a lot on why exactly we build systems to create things uh, like games, like art, like music. Um, why is it that we want to do this in the first place? And when I was working on Puck, Puck has the potential to exhaust a design space, theoretically. Um, and we can even kind of have a thought experiment of what if something like Stable Diffusion was able to exhaust its design space. Like if we could generate every single piece of artwork, um, or if we made the act of generation meaningless, uh, what would that mean for us? Would that be the end of art? Or would we have to develop a new relationship to art? Or would we maybe realize that the act of creating things is more complicated than just making the best thing we can as fast as possible? All of these game studios that are making games right now, and some of them you'll have heard talks from this week, they're not all out there looking for the best game. Um, they're not all you know, in this long process to try and find the one game that's really, really good. We're all doing this for lots of reasons, to express ourselves or to have fun or explore ideas or communicate with other people. There's so many reasons why we make games. And I want to build AI systems that can explore that a bit. I want to build AI systems that help us on the journey to making a really great game instead of worrying about whether the AI itself can output it. And lately, I've been thinking a lot about uh, this image here. So this is a tech tree from Civilization 2, I think. Um, feel free to correct me in the Q&A if I'm wrong. Um, and you can see here how in order to invent explosives, you need to invent chemistry. And in order to invent chemistry, you need to invent medicine. And in order to invent medicine, you need to invent philosophy. So it's not possible to discover explosives without discovering philosophy first. And this is kind of funny, but this is how the public understand scientific progress, right? There is a linear sequence of things that have to be discovered and they have to be discovered in order. And that's just the natural way of things. So when you tell people, oh, well, the future of creativity is that AI are just going to make things for you and you're going to describe it. And it doesn't matter if that is scary to you or weird or if you don't like it, like that's just what's happening because that's how science works. And I've been thinking a lot about that in the context of uh, what I call the giant mecha model of AI. So the Pokemon model is, you know, tiny, self-contained little creatures. Um, but what we're actually building are these huge systems that are very expensive. There's only one of them. They only, you know, most people don't know how they work. There's a lot of collateral damage. Um, and there's some great things about them. They're really cool to watch. Um, and, uh, you know, they can solve problems uh, in theory. Um, and they're really exciting to see develop. But the thing that I've realized through the last few years of building Puck and thinking about kind of what I want to do in this space and use like my funding and, and my freedom is that 
it's okay that this is now the standard. Like this is the year where I realized like it's no longer a debate. This is now the prevailing wind kind of for, for creative AI. But the one thing that, that we can do is we can offer people alternatives. We can show them maybe it could also be this way. And it doesn't matter if we don't have the PR budget or anything like that. Like we can still show small communities and engage people and say, well, maybe, maybe you'd rather AI was kind of like this. Like, how do you feel about that? Um, and that's what I want to do with Puck, hopefully. So thanks very much for listening. I'm honored to have received the Best Paper Award. Really, thank you so much. Um, if you like this talk, or maybe if you didn't like this talk and you'd like some different research, um, I supervise uh, these wonderful PhD students who have incredible ideas about creativity and AI. Each one of them is an absolute gem. And you can find me on the BAD website um, and email me as well. I'm really sorry I couldn't be there. Um, please keep yourself safe so I can see you again very soon. Um, and thank you most listening.